Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss Master Data Management Aligning Data Processing Governance, sponsored today by Informatica and Simarchy. Just a couple points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, I certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send just the panelists, but you may have chance that to network with everyone. To open the chat or the Q&A panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within the next two business day containing links to the slides and recording of the session and any additional information requests throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Koi for a brief word from our first sponsor, Informatica. Koi, hello and welcome. Oh, and you're still muted, Koi. Holy cow. Sorry, I was uh, took forever to get off mute. Hi, everyone. Oh, no worries. <laughs> you're on. You're live. You're good to go. All right. All right. So um, let me share my deck real quick. Sorry about this. Perfect. Okay. Hey, everyone. Koi Huang here from Informatica. I run our community of practice and our technical to market. Uh, more interestingly, I was one of the founders of Informatica's MDM back in 2000. And since then, We've been doing a lot of work and developing on our new uh, MDM SaaS offering. Uh, and one of the key things from our SaaS offering really is we focused on using all the experience that we had on our on-prem offering to really create a new capability, a new uh, set of products uh, altogether. And so these are the key tenants that we really focused on when we were looking at SaaS. How do we make it simple? How do we make it quicker to implement? How do we drive it through AI? What do we use for AI? And then certainly, make it scalable for everybody to be able to, to leverage. I mean, we have huge companies that are using our MDM. And then the last one is how do we really look at it from an all-in-one capability, right? So if we take a look at really quickly here, uh, what we mean by simple, being able to then configure the software in a much easier way. So, you know, changing the configuration experience so that you don't have to manage data individually, um, or sorry, you, you don't have to configure separate products. You have the ability to leverage AI to be able to, uh, to do much of the configuration. Um, making it quick, what do we mean by quick? We basically have the ability to go live very quickly. And so if you take a look at some of our current um, customers, we're talking about implementation times and in production in a matter of weeks. So for example, Great Clips and Burton, 14 weeks to go live. This is not just, uh, configuration, this actual testing, this is actually in production. We have basically GE Digital and Uber going live in 16 weeks. You know, they're actually getting usage and business to use the, the technology within that amount of time. And this is all really enabled through the AI powered uh, set of you know, capabilities. What I mean by that is if you look at across the board, we have the ability to use AI in round of matching, We're using the AI to be able to do uh, the, the mappings from source to target very quickly. We're able to identify which sources, uh, potential MDM uh, sources that could feed into an MDM, and then certainly being able to integrate and push data downstream much, much quicker. And then finally, if you're talking about scalability, um, if you're talking about scalability, we basically have, we're looking at huge customers and um, and for example, we have one of our customers, uh, a big hotel chain that has 300 million records spanning across customer mastering, supplier mastering, reference mastering, location, and, and really property to be able to, to um, provide the mastering capabilities across the organization. And then finally, this is all enabled through an all-in-one capability. So what I mean by that is across, if anybody's implemented MDM before, it's the ability to the ability to look across the board. So, you know, the first part of mastering and solutioning is um, being able to connect to different systems and being able to improve the quality of the data through data quality, being able to master through matching and management of hierarchies, and then certainly then pushing it downward. So all these are now provided in, within our single platform. So overall, I mean, that's really what we're talking about for Informatica. It's a completely new capability. 
Um, and we're looking forward to talking to you. Thank you. Chloe, thank you so much. Uh, and if you want have questions about Informatica, you may submit your questions in the Q&A section as he'll be joining us in the course at the end of the webinar. And now let me turn it over to Stephen for a brief word from our second sponsor, Sparky. Stephen, hello and welcome. Hey, hey, Shan, can you hear me? I can, you sound good, looks good. Perfect. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Stephen. I'm the product marketing manager here at Smarky. Um, today, I want to tell you a little bit about our data platform and some of the insights that we've um, seen over the past couple of years with um, the implementations and successes um, that we've done with MP MDM. So we actually ran a survey earlier this year with um, EMA research from uh, real world MDM implementations, about 100 different decision makers across all industries, sizes, and vendors. And these are sort of the three interesting um, metrics and facts that we found. So, and this might resonate and uh, be relevant in um, sort of your journey, whether you are starting out, you're in the middle of the process or um, trying your um, <laughs> first or second one. So we found that about over half of the companies have more than one MDM solution. So even with the notion of MDM being a single source of truth for organizations, uh, average is about, um, you know, two and a half uh, MDM solutions per company. The main, you know, there's obviously a lot of challenges that they've had to overcome and identify, but the number one um, way that a lot of these um, companies figured to overcome these is actually vendor support and uh, success that they're able to deliver. And, you know, the light and the rate of uh, tunnel is that 94% um, of um, the companies who implemented MDM have reported some more significant improvements in most other metrics. So what does that actually mean, right? So one of our key differentiators that we want to focus on is our successful outcomes, right? MDM is probably gonna be one of the most important um, uh, implementations that you'll have from a data and overall technological perspective and making sure it's actually successful, not just um, shelfware uh, that you purchase um, is actually critical. And that's what really what we found. Um, so our focus is really on ensuring that, you know, the data that your data initiatives especially with mdm is actually successful and you can see by some of the peer ratings that we have and then we've um really honed in on accelerating that value the time to value to uh, deploy your mdm's implementations and actually getting usage out of it so usually we're able to see um, a fully functioning mdm solution about 12 weeks um, and that really is central for our customer success organization right so we have dedicated customer success team that um, helps you meet your implementation goals um, and not just your first one, right? But your next one and what other needs that you need to grow um, and use. And then clients really trust us to basically be their long-term partner, right? So um, we have, you know, over probably a trillion different um, records, golden records that clients trust us to manage for, you know, the most important data um, in the long run. And we've recently started developing these acceleration kits that really help you from your end-to-end -end journey, right? Whether you're assessing this, is there a business case for this? How do I tell my boss and decision makers that this is actually, you know, um, something that we actually need to do? Um, and other sort of different kits uh, to help you accelerate the time to value uh, for deploying MDM. Um, in terms of what we actually get, right? So we go to market as a data platform and we have three different modules. So the main one is uh, our data management um, and then included within it is uh, data intelligence and data integration. So you could start wherever you need to because every um, organization has different needs and starting points. But once you have mastered um, these capabilities, you can expand and will the data, data platform will support uh, wherever you need to grow and scale to. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully we would love to see you um, and uh, come talk to us so we can help you deliver um, the successful business outcomes for MDM that your company needs. All right, back to you, Shannon. Stephen, thank you so much. And if you have questions for Stephen about Summer Key, you can submit your questions in the Q&A. So he'll also be joining us in the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end. Now let me introduce you to you the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of 
Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And I'm so excited. I just got to see Donna in person in an enterprise data world. Um, and with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get her presentation started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. Yes, it was good to see you. Very good conference there in Orlando this week. Um, and yeah, so thanks for everyone who joined online. If this is your first time um, with us at Dataversity or with this data architecture series, it is a series. Um, <clears throat> and we have one every month. So one of the nice things about Dataversity um, is they keep everything recorded um, for playback, I think in perpetuity. And we've done this for several years now. So if any of the topics we did in January, February are, are, are of interest to you, uh, those are available for playback. Uh, hopefully you'll join us for one of the other series um, throughout this year. And the question we always get is, is this available for playback? And yes, Shannon and her team send those out um, early next week. So you can uh, catch this again if you missed anything or share it with a colleague. So hopefully you can see us again in one of these other webinars. And, and thanks for all some of the familiar faces or names I do see in the, in the attendees. And I was able to see some folks uh, in person this week in Orlando, which is nice. It's nice when folks come up and say, hey, <laughs> I've seen you online. It's nice to see you in person. So appreciate that. So, but we are here to talk about master data management. We'll, we'll talk more about what that is. You may be new to this, which is a great part of this webinar. Um, it really is one of the things in data management that is very intuitive to understand because it's the type of data that absolutely is at the core of, of the organization. That's what makes it master. In fact, some, some of our clients actually start to call it now core data because it is so core. You know, customers, products, vendors, students, patients. We'll get more into that. Um, it can be complex. Now, I think both of the vendors that mentioned, you know, it can be complex. It doesn't, the, you know, the kind of the time to market doesn't have to be years and years and years. It should be ongoing for years and years and years because it should be driving your business. But you can get some value um, up front um, fairly quickly with some best practices that we'll talk through. And it can be very practical. So I think that's what I'll, I will be trying to cover in this webinar is that it can be overwhelming. It, 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 you know, it can be surprisingly complicated too. You know, and it, when I was early in my career, I, I said some of the naive things like, how hard can it be get a single view of customer? You know, duh, it's your customer. <laughs> well, anyone who's been doing that for a while knows the complexities of human beings and, and how you can get that golden record. So we'll talk about both. It's, it's not, um, shouldn't you take you years, but it isn't nothing either. And so how you can break that down to some very practical steps to, to move along in the journey is, is what we'll try to do today in this webinar. Um, so if you've joined these webinars before, you've seen um, the, the framework that we show. This is, I, I work with a company called Global Data Strategy. And funny enough, we do data strategies globally and, and master data is a big part of a data strategy. And, and we'll talk about some of these today, why we always show this framework is because everything is interconnected and without trying to add too much extra complexity, you know, I could do master data management, but I can't do master data management without understanding the strategy of the business. You know, what, what do we even mean by a customer? Are they retail customers? Are they companies? Are they, re you know, there's so many different nuances and, and why are we mastering it? Customers fairly really obvious, but you know, what's the prioritization of the different domains we're, we're looking for? Do we have the right data governance and, and collaboration? We'll talk a lot about that in this session. You know, tools are tools are great and they're fine, but they're only a piece of the puzzle, right? Some MDM, you know, a lot of the issue is in the business process and the people actually defining the definitions or, or typing the data into the systems or using them every day um, as they're doing their day job. So aligning that with your master data, as well as data quality, data architecture. How do you architecture your architecture master data bottom up as well? You know, what what sources are currently, you know, either feeding or consuming or touching you know, your master data, right? It seems, you know, a, a misconception. And um, I actually did a master data workshop at EDW early this week, and it was, you know, we had a day to do, half a day to do it, so we had a lot more discussion. But that is one of the misconceptions that, yes, we want a single version of the truth. It doesn't mean that we're forcing everybody to change what they're doing and put everything in one big database that they type their customers into. Not at all, right? So, but how do you integrate master data to get that golden record in, in the, the different data sources that people are using as part of their day job and then have the metadata around it and the integration and the security and the privacy and all of that, right? So master data management more than any of these absolutely does not um, live in a vacuum and it probably touches every piece of this framework um, because it is so core to the business, right? So we'll touch some of these today. 
Um, so what is master data? I am a full disclosure, very proud data management, data architecture professional, and we love ourselves some good definitions. So um, I know this is a, a data diversity and DEMA type webinar, and there's the DEMA DM box, but I'm often, often a fan of Gartner's kind of online dictionary, and they've got some good definitions, and I like the ones they use uh, for master data and then master data management. In fact, they're using that phrase. It's the consistent and uniform identifiers of this core entities, right? Customers, prospects, citizens, et cetera. You can read that. that that's a, a great way to, to, to really sum that up. It's, it's the core set of identifiers and attributes that describe the business, really. And then master data, um, it, it could be self, you know, master data management. It could be self-defining. It's the management of master data. But I like their definition as well. It's technology enabled, right? Eventually you need some sort of tool and technology. But it's really, I think, often the harder part is that you know, business and IT working together, that can be a challenge, to ensure the uniformity, accuracy, and stewardship, the semantic consistency, that's metadata, that's glossary, that's data models, and, you know, all of that, right, to really get that accountability around the official set of master data assets. And I, I like both of those together because, you know, it provides a solid business-driven definition, but it also touches on a lot of the complexity that makes master data complicated, right? If it were just one big single table of things that you know it could type in that wouldn't make it complicated but because it touches the business everywhere that's what makes it complicated and that's why it's so multifaceted so um what is master data this is actually a photo from an early cave dwelling i think it was in france i'm obviously kidding but but what i you know what this is um from one of my one of my data modeling books but it it, it gets to the point of you know when you do look at a cave dwelling what are the types of things they wrote on the on the walls? They had their animals, which is maybe their product, right? The things they consume. They had the people; those are their employees. They had maybe pictures of the you know buildings they lived in and things. So, right, those are the core. That was their business: hunting and, and gathering, right? And those were the you know their employees and, and products, really, right there. And and so, I full disclosure, and we've whole webinars this year on it. And I'm a fan of data modeling. One is because it it brings. Um, simplicity to com complexity and it's visual and i think we all, a lot of us are very visual creatures right we, we draw on cave dwellings right we the, why did we do that i don't know we just do as creatures we love cartoons we like we like to see things in a graphical way and we love simplicity to how do we take the complexity of a business and draw out those core um domains or, or things that drive the business and that's master generally that's master data and we'll talk more about that so what is master data? And I gave some examples and I'm going to give a lot of examples. I try to do that in all of my webinars because I hopefully the value that I bring is that we do this for a living and I'm old and I've done a lot of these. So what I find fun about my job um, when I'm having a good day is just the diversity of types of things that are mastered. We always talk about customer and product because those are sort of easy, but I thought it might be interesting to just give some examples of different things that are master data, and maybe more importantly, some of the business impact, right? Um, I often joke, I go across, you know, we, we do a lot of strategy. We come in and we ask some of the issues and opportunities and pain points. And generally there's that one anecdotal story that almost instills fear and you across the organ you just know you hit a nerve just by asking it and we worked in one company it was a um restaurant chain and we were talking and i noticed whenever they brought up cheese people would be like oh my gosh not that we're not going to talk about the cheese not the cheese incident <laughs> it was sort of comical from the outside i thought i was in some sort of odd movie it's like what's the cheese incident and how can you know like a bad horror movie the cheese and you can picture the the you know the music coming in i'm like what on earth is up with this cheese slice so i i you know this was a restaurant and they like to customize their menu a lot and that was one of their benefits um but and we'll, we'll actually bring this back at the end to kind of wrap up the the webinars the full story um they you know when you think of supply chain or or the um the kitchen that kind of came up with this innovative cheese slice. I think this was Swiss cheese, right? In this picture, you know, normally you had the regular old American cheese slice and that cost 50 cents, um, but they, you know, and then they, if you wanted to buy it on your point of sale, it was a dollar, but this particular cheese slice cost a lot more of that. It was very popular because it was really cool to have Swiss cheese on your, on your sandwich or hamburger, right? But every time someone upgraded to this cheese slice, they were actually costing the company money. So they actually, over the year, lost a million dollars before they cost it. Instead of the campaign was successful, they ended up losing money on it. And when you think of what is master data, 
not only was master data their menu items, but it's the really those core ingredients for them because it was a very customizable menu, cheese and you know hamburgers, and that that really was their master data, right? Uh, on a similar, not to bring up all the negatives, but one that caused some pain points, we worked with a a baby bottle manufacturer, and they, their kind of elicited fear was the two million dollar baby bottle, and and what was up with this? They they had very very popular product, um, well loved around the globe, brand recognition. But, um, and they were trying to do a whole lot more online sales. They were selling through Amazon, uh, but their master data was so manual and so inconsistent. If you've worked with Amazon, they have a particular format you must use. Their, their master data is pretty pretty strong actually. Uh, but this company kept sending a master data in the wrong format and kept getting fines. And before it was still worth it to sell off Amazon, um, but they had over $2 million in fines just for having poorly formatted master data. So that was, you know, these are very concrete things, right? Probably my favorite one, and maybe the most odd uh, in terms of you know when we're talking of a master data management webinar, we usually don't list dead fish as a master data domain. Um, but we did do a project with uh, the UK Environment Agency. In fact, they spoke with us at um, Dataversity on, on our one of these series a couple of years ago. It's still recorded if you wish to catch it. Um, but what they do for a living is track. Well, well, they do several things, but they track things in the environment, which a lot of them are living organisms, which could be cows. Yes, that's a job to go around and count cows across the countryside. Some of it was amoeba, you know, things in the water. Uh, some of it was fish. And then we sort of had, you know, this, the, the quote, business users were scientists who were basically saying, can we consolidate specimens and, and what we capture and is basically an organism, an organism. We had a bit of a joke. I felt like sort of I was in a Monty Python skit of, um, you know, is it's a living organism? What if we have a dead living organism? And we decided that, you know, a dead fish was a living organism with a status of dead, in case you care. Uh, but that's probably, you know, unique, but they actually used it for open data sets for people who are doing their own um, scientific research, you know, citizen scientists. It helped people getting their, their um, fishing license online. Uh, so it was very practical, but it seemed rather theoretical in terms of, you know, something as philosophical as what is a living organism. But they were able to consolidate a lot of their research together by stepping back. And that was their master data, right? Uh, the one on the left, you know, we worked with a hospital, um, you know, which doctor is credentialed to do heart surgery? Kind of important. I hope they get that one right. If it's my heart, we're we're working on uh, probably similar with patient. I hope it's the right Donna Burbank and they don't amputate my leg instead of do heart surgery because they didn't know who I was. Right. So super be beneficial or even what is a credential. Right. And, and what credentials link to what locations of which hospitals and, you know, the, the the one of the funny stories here, we did crack that down and only certain credential people could go into certain locations. And the, and the president of the hospital tried to get into the heart surgery wing and wasn't allowed because he wasn't credentialed. And that didn't go over well. We changed the business rule there. But but again, these were the core business rules driving the operation of a hospital. Uh, the one in the middle, we did work with a um, uh, insurance company that you know insured people like you and me, high net worth customers that you know had your ski chalet in Aspen and your apartment in Paris and had some Renoir paintings that you wanted to you know, ensure, and, and they actually were doing some really exciting kind of advanced analytics and, and um, AI and, and looking across the, all of the data sets across the internet to really understand all of the, what, what kind of businesses did their high net worth individuals own and, and some really important things that are going to tie into how they might ensure the assets of this customer. But when they brought it in house, their own master data wasn't good. They didn't know when we said Michael Jones, but they weren't names like Michael Jones. They're names we all know and probably can't say on a webinar. But, um, you know, was Michael Jones the ultra high net worth movie star uh, customer or was Michael Jones the, the, you know, the courier who's, you know, delivering um, your documents on his bike and, and isn't quite yet a high net worth customer? Pretty important when you're trying to ensure that customer, and I'm sure the, wrong, the the high net worth Michael Jones is not going to be happy if he's been misidentified, right? So that was a great example of all the great things we hear about and all the exciting things you can do with data, AI, machine learning, advanced analytics, predictive analytics. But if you're not, I know this is almost trite to this audience, but if you don't have those core building blocks, which is your master data, you can't do all the cool things with it because you're going to make predictions off the wrong Michael Jones, right? The one on the right, I'll bring back kind of bring back the environment agency again. Location is always one that somewhere, and I guess I'll bring in the hospital, right? For for the um for the environment agency, their whole business was creating maps in addition to the you know the, the organisms. 
they also created the different catchments and reasons and published some of the maps um, in the UK for the environment. So for them, location or, or a catchment or a region was a, a first order master data. I would say when we think of location, the hospital, their hospitals, their different locations and campuses were first order master data. But sometimes, you know, markets or regions, they might be reference data and not to get too academic, um, but one person's master data might be someone else's reference data. And we'll, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Sometimes they're just kind of look up fields, right? So I could go on all day because as I said, I love this stuff, uh, but it's been fun to me over my career and I will not go through each one of these. We will get a little bit meatier, but hopefully these help because sometimes it's just seems so abstract. These are all things that in, in different clients that I've worked with over the years have been master data. So we went through some of these already. One of my favorite ones was adult cow suits. Yes, that's product master. Um, but we had a few laughs of, is it adult suit large female? Is it you know male large cow suit blue? You know, <laughs> anyway, um, but that, you know, that's product master, but there were some interesting products. Um, classroom in the middle, is a classroom a virtual classroom? Is it a physical classroom? Is it the curricula in a classroom that makes it a classroom? I mean, sometimes you sound like you're being very philosophical with some of these conversations, but it was core to that educational institution of how they defined a classroom. And it was core to what they did, which is education. So that was their core master data. Um, the one right next to it, a well. If you've worked in oil and gas, a well or a, a location of a well or all the sites across the life cycle of a well, super important. Um, the upper right, that trademark, we worked with an intellectual property office where intellectual property and patents that was their master data, right? So that's pretty interesting and different. Uh, the one below it was, was components of car manufacturing and all the different components that might've been a component in another company, but it was first order master data for them. Or maybe the trucks themselves that are put together, right? A lot of this, up, you know, some of the, I'll, I'll look at that apple spice one up next to the cow. Cow with the environment agency, that was their, <laughs> that was their master data with living organism. But something like apple or apple spice, that could be a first order ingredient in the company. We work with a flavor company where flavors were master data. We had a very, again, seemingly philosophical question, but it came out that chocolate doesn't have a flavor of chocolate. Chocolate is chocolate. Ice cream can have a flavor of chocolate, but ice cream, you know, it's, it's, but that was core to their business, right? If that were not core to the business, we wouldn't have had that conversation, but it absolutely drove when you're designing flavors for chocolate companies or for ice cream companies, something as philosophical as what is chocolate or what is cinnamon spice? Is it a flavor? Is it a brand, et cetera, et cetera. So I find that super interesting and you should too, because these are all the different types of companies you can imagine. And, and they may not all be mastered. It flavor is a great example. Probably in 99% of the companies, it's an attribute of product, right? I might have a product with a flavor. At this particular company, it was their master data, right? Flavors were what they sold. And so, you know, you never know, you have to understand business and it can be really sort of fun. Um, okay, so we talk a lot about customer. So I'll bring in an example of customer and some of the benefits and risks and components of understanding master data management. So um, here's my favorite, Stefan Krauss. He's 31 years old. Uh, he lives in Switzerland. He lives the life I wish I could right now. He lives in Pontresina, Switzerland, which is near St. Moritz. He is a ski instructor at St. Moritz. Super athletic guy. He finished the Engazine, you know, uh, cross country ski marathon as a top finisher. He's like Mr. Outdoors, right? But if you, he's also kind of hip. He loves, he buys everything online. He loves to get a deal through a text message. But if you look at how much he actually purchased, it was about 500 euro in 20, but way back in 2015. Yeah, 2015. This is a little dated, right? So probably good for your cover of the magazine. Um, maybe not your, your best customer. That's so actually, not a lot. he gets all his gear free because he's a ski instructor. They give him free, free gear, right? So then we have another Stefan Krauss that lives in Zurich, Switzerland, also named Stefan Krauss. He's 62. He's a banker. And, and you know, his sport is watching European football on, on television. He's kind of more old, traditional, old fashioned. He wants, if you're going to send me a mailer, I want it physical mail. I like to physically go to the store. And I only travel once a year because I work a lot um, and I, I travel, but I'm going to buy the best gear on the planet for that one week. And I'm going to spend $3,500 on my gear. So he's probably your better targeted customer, right? I want to make a distinction because I think, and I'm not, I'm not slamming any of the vendors in this call, but a lot of the vendors I think do, or, or you just the industry, the industry in general, does, I think, mix these two. We always talk about the 360 view of customer with MDM. 360 view is the analytics. The MDM 
It's the one degree view. Who's Stefan Krauss? I can't do the 360 view if I'm trying to understand, you know, purchasing patterns of some person who just bought 3,500 euro of gear in one day in the store. Is that father? Is that son? Are they two unrelated people that happen to have the same name in Switzerland and both buy outdoor gear? I don't know. That's really where MDM, master data management, comes into play. What is a single view of customer? And some of these key relationships. Is there a household thing? Is this a household? Is this a family relationship of father, son? unrelated people, how do we identify um, these two individuals and um, set, set, set them apart? So uh, again, these 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 webinars are supposed to be a little educational. Um, so hopefully this helps. This type of picture helped me um, when I was first learning all of this. The difference between transactional data and core master data and a little bit of reference data, which is I, I consider kind of the, the little cousin of master data, very similar, related, um, and often done together. So if this were the store log of purchases from this outdoor store, um, I see that Stefan Kraus, I assume, bought a Telemark ski boot uh, for 250 euro, either in St. Moritz, Switzerland, or he lives in, you know, again, there's some met metadata around here. He is that the day he purchased, is that his birth date, is that, but we could assume maybe he he bought this product on, and again, I can I can go a whole webinar on, on uh, metadata. Is that January 1st or February, January 2nd or February 1st, right? What, what's the date format? All of that. But we could just assume these are purchase records that Stefan Carlos bought a Telemark ski boot. 250 euro, Donna Burbank bought the same Telemark ski boot, $150 in Boulder, Colorado. Um, you'll see there's a different product code. Is that right? Is that a mistake? There's different prices. Is that because Donna got a better deal or because we have different pricing in Europe and the US, um, et cetera, et cetera. Stefan Krause now bought a North Face Down jacket in Zurich. Well, is that, which Stefan Krause is that, right? So the transactions are, you know, how many products did we purchase by year? Kind of your data warehousing, the list of all the transactions, the master data is Stefan Krauss, Donna Burbank, Wendy, who Joe Smith, right? Are there two Stefan Krauses in this customer list or one? We don't know. We just know that a Stefan Krauss either bought a, a product in St. Moritz or bought a product in Zurich. It could have been Stefan traveling. To, well, we don't know. So how do you know all the attributes of customer? Product is another one. Do we know that this is the same Telemark ski boot with a different product code? Is it a completely different product that they sell in, in Europe? What, what is the standard pricing? Um, and location, that may be master data here, or these are the locations of the store. Maybe we make that as an assumption or that the location of the customer based on their credit card information. But we could assume if this were the stores of our, uh, of our outdoor store, that could be our master data. But maybe you've got some reference data codes. Why is that important? They, I mean, reference data is kind of the unsung hero, right? Uh, gosh, two letter, you know, character feels, how boring is that? But we can see right here, Boulder, Colorado is a two letter code. That's a state code. You know, St. Moritz, Switzerland, that's also a two character code that begins with a C, but that's a country code. So what are these? Are they countries? Are they states? Right? So that type of thing is really helpful with the cousin of master data, which is your reference data. But hopefully that helps make sense of the difference between those and it's hard to do a good, if, if you're reporting on, tell me all product sales by customer, if you don't have a good list of customers and a good list of products, it's going to be difficult. So um, that is where these two fits together. A little beyond this course, but if you are a data warehousing person and you've heard this idea of a conformed dimension, which is, can we get a consistent conformed view of products and customers so we can report on products you know, sold by customer who bought which product across the globe? If we want to have a simple report like that, you need good customer master, good product master, and good location master. So hopefully that helps. Um, moving along in this example, I kind of mentioned this before, but that what is master data and what is reference data? Again, depending on the use case, you know, in this case, if if this location of the store that's truly master data, some of the reference data, you know, maybe the lookup fields, those would be reference data. But again. It could be, you know, some of the, I don't know, the, the departments or regions or something within the company, maybe those are reference data, right? Just something to think about and some of it is how, how core is this to the operation of the business? Does it change over time? Or again, I know it's simplistic, but if you think of it, it's just kind of a, re a reference lookup list. And that's kind of the easiest way to see, is it um, reference data or master data? So I get this a lot. 
and it's tempting. And I'm going to do a slight Donna rant here, right? So can't we just simplify these things? We do all this, you know, we have customers, employers, and supplier contacts, and patients, and providers, and assemblers. They're all just people, right? So can't we just save a lot of time and just have person as what we're mastering? We can master, if I'm, I'm, I'm this outdoor company, I'm going to master employees and customers all in one, and even my suppliers, right? I mean, they're all people. So I'm just going to create a people master. Or, or maybe my customers are B2B. I, I sell to companies and my suppliers are companies and my partners are companies and my subsidiaries are companies. And gosh, Don and Bradstreet have a list of companies. So can't we just master company? And let's just call it legal entity or party. And, and can't party just generally be the type of company we work with? Isn't that easier? And then to that, I facetiously say, well, then we could just create a thing and just have this one big table of stuff because all stuff has fields in it and we just just put like thing one and thing two and field one and field two and just put all our stuff in it right and i'm being slightly facetious but i do think it's important because i see too much of this because when you start thinking of the business process and the governance you'll see why this breaks down so let's go through an example what could possibly go wrong why can't we just have customer and employee master is the same effort the same thing treated the same way well what if this were kind of a, a pharmacy Right. And, and uh, the pharmacist basically says to the person trying to get his prescription, great, before you get your prescription, I'll just need your salary, your social security number and your hire date before I fill your prescription. He's like, what? <laughs> That's a bizarre thing. Well, sure. As soon as I can see the list of medications you've been taking. Right. And that's maybe a, a bizarre example, but you can see what, why, why would you know the start date in the social security, maybe the social, but definitely not the salary of someone getting a prescription and the vice versa. You shouldn't know your prescriptions necessarily that your employees are on. They're absolutely different use cases, right? And, and the journey, if we talk about the customer journey versus the the employee journey, the security, the hip, one is HIPAA protected, one is not. If I'm just, my hire date is not a HIPAA protected thing, right? So it isn't just the fields. You could always say, well, okay, Donna, but in that big person table, some have, Social security number, I mean, some have salary and some don't. You just hide the field. Yeah, I guess. And, and maybe way down at the physical level, if some things are, um, you know, could be shared. But to me, that's not the hard part of master data management is truly understanding the governance, the usage, and the business process around it. And we will cover some of the data management aspects. But again, that's often not the really tricky part of master data management. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So master data management has a, at least, but the three common ones are the kind of the three-legged stool of data architecture, data governance, and your, your business processes. And, and you need to look at all of those to be successful. So, you know, a lot of the, what we heard from some of the, the tools in the beginning are absolutely important. We'll talk about that. Your data architecture, your hierarchies within your customers and your vendors and your match merge survivorship rules, how you integrate, absolutely critical. If that's not right, you're not going to be successful. And the accountability of who owns the salary, who can see the salary of an employee? When do we define the salary? Who can change a salary? Um, what are the business rules around salary? And you know, how do we, if there's a conflict on um, matching up two employees that are both named John Smith and born, born the same day, who resolves that? Like, absolutely, if that's not right, you're not going to have success. And understanding the business process and, and the customer journey and how these businesses processes map to data um, are super, super important. Uh, I'll tell one quick story here that it isn't always this easy, but we work with a big aerospace company and we do a lot of workshops in our, our org. It's a great way to kind of flesh out a lot of these details, hear different voices, because often, again, it's not the data it's as hard as getting the people in process. And this seemed like a simple thing. It was payment terms for your vendors. The payment terms, the vendor have 30 days to pay or 90 days to pay. Kind of important when you're trying to predict your revenue come in for finance, that's hugely important. And, and it was always wrong. It kept getting changed and it was updated and, and they were having problems with their finance and it was a big deal. So we walked through the process of how suppliers were onboarded. And in that process, we saw that contracts folks in the beginning set the payment terms as 30 days. And then later when sales was negotiating the contract, they changed it to 90 days for whatever reason. In that case, and I know that's an extreme, those two parties saw that and, said, and the people downstream said, oh, I didn't know that was already set. I won't do that anymore. And it was set one place in the beginning from the contracts in the beginning and it, it solved the problem. 
Again, that wasn't a data management problem. <laughs> that was a bit of a governance and a bit of a process. And that solved the problem. Had no, they didn't even need a tool for, I'm a fan of MDM tools, but they didn't need a tool for that. That was people talking together and understanding what in your business process caused things to go wrong, right? So that was kind of an extreme example to prove a point. It was all done through people in process to fix the issue. So um, back to back to Gartner, the, the, that's the, it's a bit dated now, but it still holds. This was something from one of their studies of that while the tech and the data is important, what often makes data and master data not go well, or what, what can help it go well if it goes right, is understanding that complexity around business process and governance. And, and the reasons often MDM does fail is not aligning with your business process or you know, mismanaging governance and not really understanding who owns it, who sets these rules. You know, are, the, are there a lot of these rules are going to be different. It's not something IT can set. Um, you really need to understand the business and have the business set the rules for IT to implement in the tool in the right way. So um, why, why do we say that? So, and because again, master data is your core data and the more core it is, the more it's going to be used across all of the different areas of, if, if this is customers, vendors, and materials across order to cash, source to pay, record to report, right? It's going to be used either been being produced by or consumed or both across all areas of the business, right? So the same data is going to be touched across the board. So customer, because it's so important, it's gonna to be touched all the way across the org. So one way to think of it is the who, the who what, and when of, of how this data is touched and managed across the, the board. Process models are really, nice way to show this um, and manage this. Uh, this is kind of a slightly customized BPMN or business process modeling notation, um, but it, or just a workflow. You're probably familiar with this, that the these horizontal areas are your swim lanes. Um, and, and these are the kind of the actors in the process. So in this case, this is actually a slightly anonymized version of the cheese incident, right? Product development, or in this case, the kitchen development created the product and all the different pieces um, and then it went to supply chain for costing and pricing and accounting. And then it went to marketing for market testing and then naming the product and moving on. They set a different market price, but that didn't align with supply chain's price. Is that a different price? One's theoretical price and one's actual price. Is it the same price, but they coordinate better? You know, same thing with, we had one customer code name. They had a code name in product development um, before it became the real name and it, it got out early and be, before it was properly to market. All these are master data management processes. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but your data stewards or your data owners are these folks, development, supply chain, accounting. They're the ones that know how to, who sets price? <laughs> is it both people setting price? How do marketing and supply chain work together to talk about price? That's that's a business decision, not necessarily an IT one, and, but you'll see the data that's kind of touched along the way. So one of my favorite tools with the worst name is a good old fashioned CRUD matrix. Where is data created, read, updated, and deleted? Absolutely critical when we're talking about master data, because again, it's master, it's core. Because of its coreness, is that a word? It's used by everyone, right? So a product SKU, maybe it's created by development and read by these other folks. I hope that's automated for them, right? But product name, maybe development creates a name and then marketing updates it. Has that been synced? You'd think that is so simple where we've worked in the past year and a half with three and a half to four, depending on how you define their problem. Um, major companies you've heard of in the market that have this problem, that they update the name, right? Because getting a name right in the market takes some time. You do some testing, but they may have made a you know test case and they go to market. Some of the materials still have the wrong name. Something as simple as the name of your product is critical and it, it still goes wrong. So how do I set the process for your master data to make sure when I change the product name, that's synced across, we all agree, and it's synced across the board. Actually, all of these, I think it's been a whole effort for master data, the weight of the product, the price of the product. It seems so simple, <laughs> but because it's used across the board and these are so critical to product, absolutely critical to manage. So that's why these business process models and these CRUD matrices fit really nicely together. So when I receive the order, what day, you know, the, this this kind of cartoony example, I think goes well, like in a workshop, I can say, okay, this is where it goes. And this is where I you could even sticky note it, you know, here's where I put the name and here's where I put the price. And again, that 
that aerospace company, that's how they solved the problem. They saw that their sticky notes weren't aligned and they solved it, right? But then to take it to the next level, something like this CRUD matrix gives it a little, and you'll probably have dozens of attributes. Uh, this is a nice way to kind of make it really clear of, you know, when I receive the order, um, I'm, I'm creating the customer name and the order name and the account number, and I'm just reading the product from something else, right? So you can you can kind of see where or here here two groups are updating, um, you know, the same account number or three several groups, right? So you can kind of see those conflicts. It also ties really nicely into governance because these people in the swim lanes are your data stewards. These are the people in the field updating, creating, and deleting. Um, and and should have an an input into who can read this data, who can see it, who sets the price, right? With that with that um, aerospace company, who who sets the payment terms for a vendor, right? Those are business decisions. They are not tech decisions. They can be enabled by tech, but that's hopefully these are kind of ringing some bells of why without understanding business process um, and the journey, um, you know. Uh, beyond the scope of this webinar, but we also sometimes do, you know, customer journey maps from the customer perspective. Who hasn't had that horrible customer service of, you know, I changed my address online and I'm still getting my, my bills sent to the wrong address. And, or, you know, I called in my, to update my credit card address and I'm still getting, you know, and we all know in, in data management, it's probably because it went to the ERP system and didn't update the, you know, the mailing system that sends out your, your ads or whatever. Right. But that, from a consumer perspective, that's pretty darn annoying. <laughs> so how, how do you map that out? Or we've done this a lot with universities, the, the student journey, you know, what, what or patient journey, right? Oh, how does the data get collected from the customers or patients or students or citizens experience, right? Um, so these are really, really helpful in this different ways to do it. Um, you know, not, this could be a whole webinar on data governance roles, but here's some that are fairly commonly defined of the owners are gonna set those high level rules um, you know, can can who can see social security number or you know social insurance number in Canada or whatever? Right? How how who can see what or what are the high level rules or what? How do we prioritize our domains? Your business data stewards are going to be a little more in the weeds. They're probably in the systems and understanding you know what drop down fields should be or some of the more detailed business rules that that are probably still approved and vetted by the owner. But these folks are a little in the weeds. When a technical data steward, maybe they understand the CRM system. So if we're trying to set business rules in your CRM or ERP or whatever, hopefully that's a combination of your business and technical data stewards because the tech should support the business, right? Just a quick sample, again, tons of good material and data diversity here and elsewhere about governance, but hopefully that kind of fits that together that these folks in your swim lanes are probably your stewards doing the work. So that leads me to um, quickly, because I, I know I want to get to some of the questions, but there are many ways to do governance and stewardship, right? You can do it by process, that the process owners, who does billing and pricing, those are you are going to be your stewards or not a fan, but by systems, maybe those are your technical data stewards, they, right? I'm the technical data steward for my CRM or my billing. Um, data domain, this is gonna be another Donna rant, seems like this is the right one to pick. I'm gonna have a domain owner for customer or for product. Hold that thought, I hopefully will tell you why I feel very strongly that's not a great method. <laughs> or org section centric, is it finance, marketing? Is it North American marketing and Europe marketing? Is it all of that? Or some companies like to do more of a capability centric model because org charts change, capabilities don't. Whatever you call finance, um, it's still finance. So I could call HR, you know, people management this year and maybe it's talent management next year, but it's still the capability of managing people, right? Why I don't like data domain center, we'll go more into it. But hopefully you've seen in some of those process models, great, who owns customer? Is it billing that owns customer, sales that owns customer, marketing that owns customer? They'd probably all love to raise their hand and be like me, but they all have different perspectives on what, you know, does how I build a customer is very different than how I market to the customer. So they all should have a voice. Um, which again, why generally in some sort of governance structure, this cross-functional representation. If I'm looking at customer, for example, I hope sales, marketing, product development, legal, what I can what I can legally do with you know different data privacy laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, should all have a voice. And to the people who say that's going to slow things down, well, if you don't do it, it's going to be work, you're going to be clearing things up. And you can make some, again, extreme example of a workshop solve the problem with payment terms. But it often doesn't take much longer than that if the right people are in the room and they understand 
the downstream effects that at least give some visibility. It's also nice if you are on the technical side and you can you can chant from the rooftops all day of you can't change this field or you can't own this field because somebody else uses it downstream. But when people collectively hear it together and see from the other per person's point of view how these different fields are used, it just generally be, it becomes more productive because they're doing it as a team. Um, so that's why I feel you shouldn't have one owner from for customer, for product, et cetera. That said, from an architecture perspective, you absolutely should create these domains. And maybe there's a data architect or a master data team managing things like customer or product. It is a big deal, but it's because it's such a big deal, that's why you can't have one owner, right? So we're, um, conceptual data models, full disclosure, I love data models. Often this is the roadmap for your org. What I love about a conceptual data model, in one page, you really describe the org of we have products, customers, suppliers, and patients, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, in one page. We often even just color code it. You know, maybe blue is your master data, beige is your reference data, and, and white is your transaction data. I mean, it's a really, I've had customers kind of prior, you can't do all of your master data domains at once. So if our master data domains are staff, customers, and products, what are we working on when? And are there relation interrelationships between customers and staffs and staffs and staff and, and product? Absolutely. So it helps kind of put that all in context. And then from there, absolutely you need to understand the critical data elements or the detail around customer. And this is a whole, it's a bit of an art and a science. You shouldn't have a hundred, but you should have more than one, right? Of, of all the attributes around customer, first name, gender, date of birth, et cetera. So um there are different ways to implement a master data. Again, some of the um, misconceptions are often that it has to be one big central system. Um, you could do registry where it's still stored in the source system and you just have pointers to it. Coexistence, I think I often like this when it's um, kind of more mature that yes, you're still entering customers in the CRM and your ERP and, and, and that's how, but your MDM is sort of a coordinator across it. You could do a centralized where everything's in the MDM and pushes out or and or um, often this analytical focus where you consolidate MDM for kind of data warehouse reporting can be kind of a helpful way to start because operational master data is absolutely valuable and life changing for a company. That's that's where you, you update your address once and everybody gets the correct address. You can also imagine if that's done incorrectly with the wrong address, what the downside is. So that's why sometimes it's nice to do analytical as a first step, make sure we're all right. Worst case, a report is wrong that we can correct, but it's not gonna you know, affect your operational systems. And then when that's confident, do it with your operational. So the idea is that you do have master data in your different source systems. MDM can be this golden record, can feed your warehouse, feed your reporting, and then publish and subscribe. And you have these different you know, data quality. Sometimes you need human in the loop with your data validation. Is this the right patient that I'm, doing surgery on, even if my match rules are absolutely confident, I probably still want someone looking at that one. I'm going to amputate a leg, pretty important. Whereas maybe for a marketing campaign, 90% probability is good enough that it's the same person, right? So the idea is that your model, you have these names, et cetera, across all of your different systems, first name, last name, date of birth, et cetera. And then MDM, you can think of it either as a superset or subset, right? Superset in that not every system maybe has all the attributes you want, but a subset, it isn't everything you ever want to report on. It's that core identifiable, you know, golden information about, say, for example, a customer in this case, right? So the idea of these, these tools are we can create these matching because you don't want to go through your billions of customers and say, yep, I think that's John Smith. I mean, that's a perfect thing for a tool to do with the business rules that your data stewards set. Right. So how do I know that this is the right John Smith? Um, is it by first name, last name, first name, last name, date of birth? That's kind of the mad, the art and the science of how you do those matching. And then from which systems do you create that golden record? Do I take the name from one system? And th there's some art and science to all of that. Right. So that is like <laughs> for the, for the tool vendors probably like, wait a minute, that's our core thing. And then there's, there's a lot to this, but at its most simplest, it can be complicated, but what are the rules and what are the priorities and how do I survive this golden record is really a lot of the, the oomph that the automating this can, can give as long as the business people are setting these rules. One more slight rant, if you didn't get it before, 
MDM is not reporting or analytics. It enables it, right? So I've created that one view of Stefan Kraus or John Smith. That's going to be a dimension in my warehouse. Then I can report on customers by region because both of those are master data. I can do a graph pattern to see what other people buy similar products and do all this great, but you can't do that if the nodes of the graph are not right, right? Or you can feed your data lake and do some social media sentiment analysis, but you have the right customers, right? So it is the one degree view that enables the 360 degree view, if that makes sense. Um, one quick example, I kind of gave this across the way, but this was this was the cheese incident, right? That this company just knew they were losing money. They didn't exactly know what it was to solve. And we did a lot of interviews. We talked to the kitchens, we talked to the menu, we talked to supply chain, we went to the restaurant and saw the point of sale. They had some governance, they had some process issues, but at its core, it was using master data management to create that single view of the menu and the ingredients. Um, we had the buy-in of marketing, of supply chain, of sale. Everybody was bought in and they had to solve it together, right? And that's where the business process and the governance came in. So the, the solution was master data. How we came to the solution and how we solved that was combining that master data with the process um, and the governance around it of who, who owned price, right? And, and who owned the ingredients on a menu and, and things like that. So um, with that, a lot, in fact, one of the first comments I, I um, what was, you know, love this topic, it's, it's really relevant. It is, the more things like AI, um, the, the more you know, analytics we wanna do, you're going to need good master data. For good master data, you need not only architecture, but also process and governance. And getting this right, there's a bit of work, but it's absolutely exponential. That's gonna have a positive impact on your pricing and your sales and your efficiency, right? So. I hope you can join us for next month where we'll talk a little bit more of that architecture and governance um, collaboration. We do this for a living. So full disclosure, if you need help with any of this, we're happy to help. My email is in the, the second slide. And with that, I will send it over to Shannon to, for Q&A. Donna, thank you so much as always for an amazing presentation. I'm gonna dive right into the questions here. Um, do you, when it comes, to MDM, how is that accomplished when your system is fed by other data sources? Do you, does your manager, do you manage it manually or bring it in a third party to help manage all of the data? Well, I hope I kind of got to that a little bit with that. The, I'm not sure when that came in. I think it came in early, um, but that picture I have where, of course, I can't move my own slides again. Um, that is the crux, right? Is that by definition, your MDM is going to be across systems, whether they're external, sometimes they're external, you have less control or even internal, you're going to both publish and subscribe from them. So get the information from and push out. And then there's different ways you can do that. And some of them are in evolution, but absolutely understanding what sources, where the data comes from, um, the quality of data within those and what you need to augment, that to me is a, a huge part of the crux of MDM. So hopefully that the, the, the remainder of these slides helped with that question. Perfect. Koya or Steven, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it depends on the level of the maturity of the organization. Right. If you kind of have a smaller company, then you most likely you won't have a governance process. And then you have to look at potentially getting some advice from, you know, some services companies. Uh, whereas if you have a large company, most of the time there is a governance council. There is potential stewards within organization or within departments that you want to combine. And then you create a, a governance team out of that. So it, it does vary. I would push back on that a little, even though there's not a huge huge governance organization, there's going to be SMEs, and I would never outsource your business rules to a third party. <laughs> I, I just, because yeah. that's core, they they yeah. should be asking the folks running. They might have yeah, been yeah, some yeah. other companies, but it should be. Yeah, it's, it's more of advice on how to get started, not necessarily, you know, like out, outsourcing the whole governance process. It's just, if you don't have a, uh, know where to start, then, you know, some of these folks would say, okay, this is how you get started. Uh, these are the people that you need, need, need to pull in and then certainly these are the kind of things that you need to look at. Like Donna, you were talking about the business processes, right? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Steven, anything you want to add? I think, I think they, people answered the question well Perfect. enough. I don't need to add. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I know we're coming close. I'm gonna slip in one super quick question. Just the elevator pitch for everybody. Do you think the biggest implementation or impediment to MDM implementation and usage is that companies are typically organized by function and not business process? 
I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think that's just a truth, right? I mean, sometimes when I gave, and I'll give the other folks a chance to answer too, but when I showed those um, governance models, sometimes it's both. Like maybe the data ownership is at the function level, finance, marketing, but um, marketing has a lot of different processes, lead gen and, and you know, market research and things like that. So maybe at that point, some of the processes, but you can get started. And, and again, a lot of this can seem big, but you can start with just a few functions and move out. But I, I don't think that's an impediment. I think it's just a fact and you just want to be flexible of how you do your ownership and, and stewardship within that. But curious what the other guys think. Well, actually, that's one of the reasons MDM was created in the first place, right? Because yeah. you had silos of data and everybody felt that they were special until they, they got together and like, oh my God, we have a data problem. Yeah. And so then MDM really was was um, developed to fix that you know, and, and create the cross section across them. But the, the important thing though, is that you have to keep those stakeholders involved the whole way so that they don't think that it's developed for someone else. Absolutely, I agree. Perfect, well, that brings us right to the top of the hour. Thank you all so much. Thank to Informat and to Summer Key for sponsoring and helping to make today's webinar happen. Thanks to Donna, as always. And thanks to our community for being so great and having such a great engagement and great questions. Uh, just to answer the most commonly, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, y'all.